Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and their ancestors and those who are with us, perhaps not in person but in spirit today. Um, I'd also like particularly to welcome the Honourable Barry O'Farrell, the Premier of New South Wales, um, the Honourable Mike Rand, who I don't think is here yet but will be, um, Geoffrey Robertson and the board members of the Whitlam Institute, and our principal supporters, David Thompson, CEO of Jobs Australia, Talal Yassin, founder and managing director of Crescent Wealth, Nadine Flood, National Secretary of the CPSU, and Justin DeLolo, Managing Director of Hawker Britain. And of course, to everyone else here today, all of our distinguished guests, a warm welcome. Today's symposium is the third in a series that began with the 2009 Symposium on Governing the Economy, which featured Dr Ken Henry, Bernie Fraser, Professor Warwick McKibben, and Productivity Commissioner Gary Banks. Bernie Fraser made the point on that occasion that the ultimate goal of policymakers is not to maximise growth numbers or minimise inflation numbers, but to help create a better, fairer society. The 2010 symposium picked up that theme more explicitly. The speakers there, which included the Federal Treasurer, the Honourable Wayne Swan, and then New South Wales Shadow Treasurer, the Honourable Mike Baird, explored an economic framework and related policies for establishing a robust economy that balances the often competing factors of growth, sustainability, wealth creation and distribution, prosperity and equity, global and domestic demands. So today's symposium builds further on those conversations. It recognises that employment, not just jobs, but decent work, lies at the heart of a prosperous and fair nation. So it's with pleasure that I welcome everyone today to the 2011 UWS and Whitlam Institute Symposium on the evolution of the Australian labour market. Over the next several hours, we'll have the particularly good fortune of hearing from a number of those working in the engine room of labour market policy and also of employment practices. In the case of our first speaker, I would also suggest we are also very fortunate to have with us a senior captain of the Ship of State. For those of us who live in New South Wales, the Premier State, Barry O'Farrell is a familiar member of our households, a companion in our living rooms each evening, there at the breakfast table, I'm sure he's not in his pyjamas, I am, um, with the telly or the herald each morning. Barry O'Farrell was sworn in as the 43rd Premier of New South Wales on the 28th of March of this year. He, of course, isn't ours alone, although we like to claim him. As you'll see from your program, he was born in Victoria, schooled in the Northern Territory, and attended, attended university at the Australian National University, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts majoring in Australian History and Aboriginal Studies. Without wishing to appear too parochial and, wishing, and, and meaning no offence to our friends here from other states, it's fair to say that having sampled life across Australia, he has chosen to be a New South Welshman. Not by birth, but by choice. Um, he's shown himself also to be a strong believer in public policy as a driver of good government, underpinning the focus on, the, on high quality services for the people of New South Wales, while building and renovating the state's infrastructure and maintaining a strong budgetary position. He's been a member of the Liberal Party since 1980 and was first elected to the New South Wales Parliament as the member for Northcote in 1995. He's been the member for Karingai since 1999 and served as the leader of the opposition between 2007 and 2011. All these are great achievements, but of course the most important thing to know about the Premier is that he's also the Minister for Western Sydney, our own turf. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to invite him to address us this morning. Thank you, Professor Reed, Geoffrey Robertson, Graham Freudenberg, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think all the Vice Chancellors. Uh, I constantly remind that I have no vested interest in any university in New South Wales. 
there are 11 fine universities in New South Wales. There's a great university in Western Sydney. Uh, but it means that uh, I have no partiality to any, so that's a good thing for, uh, for all the VCs uh, who are keen to, uh, to claim us. Um, it's probably rare, but in July of this year, I had my Gough Whitlam moment. I was in the Great Hall of the People on my second visit to China um, and discovered that it was the very room that uh, Gough Whitlam had been bidden to in 1971 when he was to meet at Chow Enh Lai. And it was clear to me that uh, from that historic meeting in 1971 uh, that the national and Australian economies uh, could have been entirely different uh, without that strategic vision shown by the then Federal Leader of the Opposition. And whilst Whitlam said that the measure of the success of his mission was, quote, the hysteria it provoked in the Liberal Party, end quote, from the earliest days, uh, our Australia-China relationship has been a matter of bipartisanship with Mr Whitlam's Liberal successor visiting China within his first 12 months of, as Prime Minister. So the momentous engagement of our two ambitious nations laid the framework for a productive and continuing trade and cultural relationship that the New South Wales Government is keen to strengthen and keen to grow. And whilst happy here today at the Whitlam Institute to give credit to Gough Whitlam, I also believe that Neville Rand should be acknowledged for his vision in establishing a link between New South Wales and Guangdong uh, in a sister state relationship. The seeds for that New South Wales Wangrum relationship were sowed in 1977 when Premier Rand accepted an invitation from the Government of China to visit. He later told Parliament that his visit was in the main an exploratory one, exploratory one, aiming to further friendship and understanding between New South Wales and the People's Republic of China, to develop new trading relationships and to explore what he termed technical exchanges. Premier Rand's ministerial statement uh, following his visit uh, provides an insight into the benefits of the 40-year-old relationship and the differences between China then and now. And that's evidence when he said that, quote, he was told by senior officials that although the government had ensured sufficient food and clothing for its people, their standard and quality was unacceptably low. The Chinese policy, he said, is one of achieving self-sufficiency. It seems to me that Australia should be more active in seeking to provide the needs to, or seeking to provide to the needs of the Chinese people. And as we've seen, the rising living standards of the Chinese are now changing corporate marketing strategies around the world. Corporate market strategies that were once focused on the consumer society and population of America uh, that's now looking at the growing middle class of China that numbers almost 300 million. By 2013, the United Nations says that China's middle class will be 1.4 billion, uh, which, is, which will be four times the size of the American middle class. The contribution of trade between China and Australia and China and other countries has materially improved the living standards of us all, with Australia enjoying greater choice in goods across a range of price points, many sourced from China, and job opportunities and investment returns flowing from companies who supplied commodities and services to China. Premier's reign visit in 1977 did bear fruit, with New South Wales agreeing in 1979 to form a sister state relationship with Guangdong province, a relationship that recognised the strong links between New South Wales and China, both in terms of trade, with a third of all Australian exports going to China, coming from New South Wales, and 50% of China's exports to Australia landing and being destined for New South Wales. So I was conscious when I visited Guangdong province in July and met Governor Huang Huawa that I was the custodian of uh, a th almost 30 year old sister state relationship uh, that, and that the leaders of Guangdong, that the leaders of Guangdong had bestowed on New South Wales in their first ever relationship with any state anywhere in the world. When Neville Rand said that Guangdong is the province from which the majority of Chinese Australians originated and is, the training, and is the trading gateway to and from China, he appreciated, as I do, that New South Wales' greatest asset is not to be found underground, it's to be found above the ground in its multicultural community. 
with one quarter of our citizens born overseas, 40% with at least one uh, overseas born parent, a third of whom will speak in a language other than English at home each night, with 200 languages present uh, across our state, 187 nationalities in this city, with more than 300,000 people of a Chinese background in New South Wales, 50% of the nation's total, and our multicultural community that maintains strong business ties, whether Chinese or other, back to the countries of their origin. So why is the origin of our China relationship relevant to a symposium on labour market evolution in Australia and the notion of well-being as a goal of economic policy? Well, very simply, China drives competition in the Asia Pacific and in the world, and that includes in Australia. Our early engagement, our proximity, our competitive advantage, and our appealing mix of commodities and service expertise gives us a strong edge on others in this area. But whilst our economy is currently the envy of many developed countries, we coast at our peril on any assumption of the unchallenged strength of our relationship with China in relation to trade. And whether Europe takes some tough decisions or not, we in Australia and New South Wales must continually hone our edge if we're to maintain and grow what we have. While we watch the challenges being faced in distant jurisdictions like Greece and Spain, Italy, Ireland, and even Britain with interest. The turnover of political leadership in these countries tells us that citizens want change. And if they have the stomach for the fiscal disciplines required for a return to economic health, we welcome the, op the opportunities that offers to their citizens, whilst at the same time re realising that our competitors, particularly in developed service economies, will become harder to beat in that global marketplace, which of course includes China. The size and success of our China relationship is our standing reminder of the need for strong economic management and fiscal discipline here within New South Wales. New South Wales bilateral trade with, New South, with China represents $21.6 billion a year in a state whose own annual, annual budget expenditure and revenues total around $60 billion annually. So I can think of no greater incentive, not just to nurture, but aggressively defend that relationship than by lifting our own economic game. And that requires us to be smart and flexible in the way in which we produce and value the assets of our labour market so we can sustain labour, so we can sustain employment and productivity growth. And by doing so, offer competitive advantages to investors and exporters, and as a result, offer greater opportunity, choice and quality of life for our New South Wales citizens. And that's that fair outcome that Bernie Fraser spoke at the first of these symposiums about. Now, just as when Chinese leaders spoke to Neville Rand in 1977 about improving the living standards of their people, these objectives are every bit as relevant to us in New South Wales today, where a quality of life that is the envy of many in the world still creates challenges to families and businesses as they struggle to manage cost of living increases. The tensions between growth and equity, our two-speed economy, between city and regional New South Wales, between commodity and non-commodity communities, is just as really real as in China, but where World Bank economist Branko Milanovic asked, uh, asking whether China will survive in 2048, says, the most serious threat to China is Chinese unity, which is creating inequality. The five richest provinces, including our sister state province, Guangdong, with 25% of, of the total population, are responsible for 40% of China's GDP. And that's the sort of concern about inequality being created in China that the World Bank is concerned about. When we came to government in March, we unashamedly set ourselves the goal of making New South Wales number one again. A goal that was overwhelmingly endorsed by 2.1 million people across New South Wales, people eager for change. And our best prospect, we understand, of expanding the opportunities of all citizens of New South Wales to share in whole of state growth is to grow the state's economy. Uh, and to grow the state's economy across the state so that they can share in the benefits of that strong growth, whether they're in city or regional New South Wales. But the strong economy is not, as Bernie Fraser um, was, uh, reminded us, an end in itself. By growing the economy, we not only create the jobs that people need, we not only create the opportunities that people seek in their lives, we not only generate the confidence that people want to make those leaps that see people progress in our community, 
It also generates the revenue to government necessary to provide the public services upon which people build their lives. Health, public order, education, community services, especially those services that a market can't or won't supply. By growing our economy, we produce surpluses to invest in new infrastructure, essential to the efficient production and distribution of goods and services, and to allocate taxes and charges where possible, uh, making business uh, more competitive and putting downward pressure on those cost of living increases that families and businesses are struggling with. None of us would enjoy the opportunities we do were it not for private citizens, private and social enterprises and investors. Now, state governments can't influence interest rates. We can't fix Europe's economic problems or their effect on global markets. But what we can do is get out of the way and off the back of enterprising people. We can give a clear idea of our strategic priorities and we can open the door to private and social enterprise participation and investment in the public sector economy, whether in infrastructure, services or in thought leadership. I think the best contribution that government can make to maximising our competitive position is to identify those factors we can influence and then to get on and fix them. By reducing, for instance, the statutory cost of doing business in a state and city like this, by investing in productive infrastructure and getting our own fiscal house in order so we can reduce the shared costs and provide services more efficiently, including those that support exports and attract trade and investment to New South Wales. Our economic and fiscal strategy must also engage with national issues. I don't believe we can be blind to the reality that since the major competitive reforms of the last decades lifted productivity by close to 2%, uh, uh, national productivity growth has slumped to around 0.4% each year. Australia and New South Wales is facing major challenges as our national productivity declines. The credit in the bank of resilience that was built up by the Hawke and the Keating and the Howard governments is being spent fast by the incumbent federal government. So our focus must be on increasing productivity and improving our competitiveness within Australia and the global environment. And I'm determined to lead, New South, to lead for New South Wales with reforms to lift our public sector productivity and performance and reduce obstacles through COAG or other initiatives to either jurisdictional mobility, the commerce and investment, and to lighten the load on the only people who actually produce our wealth, the private sector, large, medium and small. Whether within our domestic or international economy, isolationism is death. As the Lowy Institute's Michael Wesley warns, Australians have to abandon a tendency to be well-travelled, but still insular in our perception of the world, in which our traditional approach is no guarantee that our strengths to date will guarantee us any, another 60 years of safety and wealth in the changing globe. But Wesley notes that our optimism about our future and our place in the world, and that 70% of Australians believe China is important to our economic future. Part of my belief is that equally essential uh, is continued growth, and growth in all things. For 223 years, this has been a place of opportunity for people who've come uh, all around the world. Uh, I seriously and furiously disagree with the utterances of a friend of my grand's uh, as Premier, who, who was Premier 11 years ago, who said that, that um, send them elsewhere, Sydney is full. Uh, I ac absolutely believe uh, that growth is good, that without growth there is stagnation, and with stagnation there is death. Uh, so I think and I embrace the idea that uh, our great multiculturalism, the multiculturalism that characterises the community that uh, the University of Western Sydney serves across uh, uh, this city, but a multiculturalism that exists across New South Wales is our great asset, is a virtue, is a strength, uh, and must be welcomed, must be embraced, and importantly, has to be planned for when governments providing services uh, and infrastructure to areas whether Western Sydney or Western New South Wales. On our first day in office, the gravity of our fiscal challenge was revealed in a Treasury briefing uh, that showed that New South Wales public sector wages growth was higher than the New South Wales private sector wages growth and higher than the rest of Australia's private and public sectors. It showed a worsening net lending result and trend with expense growth way above revenue growth and the prospect of a ratings downgrade mid-term if nothing had changed. And it forecast deficits from financial year 2012 onwards. 
And that's why our fiscal strategy revealed in the September budget started to bring New South Wales finances back under control, sought to boost public sector productivity with a $5.2 billion turnaround compared with the March 2011 position that we inherited, which sets us on a course to return to average annual surpluses from 2012-2013. The budget does deliver long overdue productivity reforms, implementation of wages policy, actually requiring that uh, any increases above 2.5% be offset by real productivity increases, uh, targeting a 5,000 voluntary public sector redundancies and an end to a policy of no forced redundancies across the public sector, uh, close to a billion dollars in program and efficiency savings, actions to boost housing under supply and affordability by redesigning stamp duty concessions to target new constructions tax relief to improve our competitiveness, including payroll tax rebate for the creation of jobs and abolishing a home buyer's tax imposed by the last government, and implementing our policy of contestability, starting with the provision of ferry services on Sydney Harbour. We recognise the inherent problems of public monopolies wherever they occur, and believe that they should uh, be open to challenge on their costings. Where there's a better way of delivering a government service, to a standard that meets or exceeds the benchmark that we set, that delivers it at a cheaper price, we believe that government should not only consider it, government should embrace it. Our fiscal strategy is supported by the work of a commission of audit, which will identify the opportunities for long-term systemic reforms to produce further savings and efficiencies. And the report of that commission of audit, Peter, I think is due to be released next month. Uh, well, I know it's to be released next month. Uh, rebuilding. Just checking. Rebuilding our finances will also help us rebuild our infrastructure. Infrastructure isn't an end in itself, but investing in economic projects not only improves our competitiveness, but grows that economy with all those benefits that I raised earlier about the benefits of, of that strong economy to individuals and individuals' lives. That's why one of our first tasks was to establish infrastructure in New South Wales, an arm's length from government, to put together that a strategic infrastructure framework that the community can have confidence about, that the finance sector can have confidence about, that the construction sector can have confidence about, um, and that can guide government spending uh, into projects that will not only ensure that uh, the experts, not politicians, make the assessments, uh, but will synthesise demographic and land use supply, port logistics, transport, telecommunication services, energy and industry requirements, rather than the usual New South Wales business as usual what's going to get the most political bang for the buck out of this particular project. We're also determined to take the challenge up to South Australia and other states and get a fair share of funding from Infrastructure Australia. And that's why in our submission that we've set out, we seek funding for the North West Railing for the Port Botany Airport Roads Improvement Initiative, that's the M4 and the M5, and also for the Pacific Highway, which is the largest road, the, big, the, the, the highway freight corridor in Australia that carries the most freight uh, we're already fast tracking the North West Rail Link and construction of the uh, South West Rail Link continues apace. We've expressed, uh, we've put out expressions of interest for a public private partnership for new convention exhibition facilities in Darling Harbour. Uh, we've taken a decision to enter into a lease for the desalination plant uh, uh, for our Port Botany port facilities uh, and also last week announced the sale of the state's generators uh, development sites on the Kabora coal mine all designed to free up capital, to invest in infrastructure, all designed to get assets off the balance sheet to enable borrowings to try and bridge that infrastructure deficit that uh, we inherited. Uh, that, in addition to the $62.5 billion budget infrastructure program that was outlined, is designed to ensure that we do have, finally in New South Wales, uh, a strategic pipeline of infrastructure projects that everyone can count on. Discipline performance uh, management is essential if we're to achieve our goals. I was fascinated when I was in China in July to hear about the 12th, 50 year plan. We're about to start the, uh, the first um, uh, 10 year plan in the history of New South Wales. Uh, any organisation, especially one as complex as government, whether in New South Wales, South Australia or other jurisdictions, uh, needs to articulate its goals and targets, needs to measure and report its performance as transparently as it can. And absolutely the first time it's going to be scary. Absolutely the first time the Telegraph is going to have a field day. But it's not about the first time. It's about the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, so that you can see progress. Uh, and that's what we're committed to. So alongside the state budget delivered in September, we released New South Wales 2021, uh, which sets out uh, 80, um, 180 targets, 32 goals, uh, no wriggle room in any of them. 
uh, it uh, recognises that defining, in defining our priorities, we also define what's not a priority, which is one of the ways we maintain discipline in the way in which government seeks to allocate its funding. Uh, New South Wales 2021 links goals and targets to the budget and budget processes, and it forms the basis of annual agency funding agreements with Treasury, uh, performance agreements with senior bureaucrats, uh, and the performance expectations that I have of people who sit around the Cabinet table. And first of our 32 goals is to improve the performance of the state's economy. So we've committed ourselves to growing business investment at an average of 4% per year to 2020. And our target is to grow GSP per capita by an average of 1.5% to 2020, with specific industry growth targets uh, set. And they include doubling tourism, growing critical industries, increasing the value of primary production and mining production, and growing exports from New South Wales, all with real figures set next to them to drive my ministers, to drive the public service, uh, to explain to the population of New South Wales precisely in what direction we're heading, uh, exactly what priorities we have. And we don't want to, and we certainly don't believe that government has all the answers. I'm the last person, I, most of my speeches have happened with claim that government doesn't have all the answers, and government certainly doesn't have all the best uh, ideas. Uh, and we are determined to ensure that we collaborate with all the sectors across our society. And it's one of the reasons why, as Professor Reid knows, uh, we've been so keen to work for the first time, I think, at a, at a close level uh, with the university sector in New South Wales, which is not just uh, a great place that we went to when we were younger, uh, not just uh, a centre of learning for our future generations, but on its own uh, is an important economic uh, uh, growth uh, centre for the New South Wales economy. We believe that by opening up even more public services to healthy competition on cost and quality of results, we can challenge all providers, including the public sector, to innovate and improve their own performance. So we can offer citizens and taxpayers the best quality, the most effective services for the least burden on their pockets and the least burden on taxpayers. So the New South Wales Public Service Commissioner will take responsibility for restoring transparency and ensuring the professionalism of the professional integrity of our public sector and to build the necessary capabilities across the public sector to meet the challenges of an increasingly diverse and demanding customer base. And we're looking for more ways to give back to communities. I'm an odd sort of character. I actually trust communities to make good decisions for themselves. Uh, and we want communities, individuals, to make as many decisions for themselves about as many services that they uh, have access to as possible, because I'm a great believer that people um, will more efficiently and more effectively uh, deliver services locally uh, than a remote central government, whether in Beijing or in this case, whether in Sydney. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's said that in China, people refer to Gough Whitlam as the man who dug the well. In 1971, when he scraped that first layer of earth back, I was in my first year of high school. I was in my fourth year of high school uh, during the dismissal. And I was in my final year of university when Neville Rand entered into that sister-state relationship with Guangdong Province. Uh, 1.6 million people under the age of 40, and that no longer includes me, believe that a strong trade relationship between Australia and China, between New South Wales and provinces in China, uh, is a natural and unremarkable feature of modern society. So the risks of failing to continue to meet ongoing competitive trade and investment pressures meant, uh, to simply stay in the race is a threat to the well-being of every one of those citizens into this state and to this nation. Whilst we share many of China's objectives, economic growth and better opportunities for our citizens, we've taken very different approaches to define and achieve them. There are obviously obvious differences in our political systems and in our measures of success. But how do our uh, gro economic growth strategies compare? Ours is transparent and straightforward, and I've outlined some of our strategies and achievements to maintain that transparency and to set even higher standards for the future. Our classical liberal traditions shape our beliefs in the virtues of free markets, private property ownership, a smaller government, uh, and the lowest possible taxation levels. It's harder to decode the strategy behind China's success. Uh, that World Bank economist Branko Milanovic asserts that the incredible economic rise of China was achieved by using a mixture of recipes never seen before without any codified rules of economic conduct. It is, as I've heard, former Prime Minister Bob Hawke say, one of the uh, economic miracles uh, uh, in the history of mankind. 
observing China's reticence to sell a specifically Chinese model of development or economic ideology, uh, Milanovic suggests it would, be, it would all seem to have been the product of a series of serendipitous, unique and unrepeatable circumstances or accidents, not linked by any grand idea, just detonement, their experimentation, and what he describes as a few lucky strikes. <coughs> Whilst anyone who's been to China can marvel at the scale of Chinese achievement, I'm not sure I can agree that it was simply about luck. Uh, Graham Freudenberg, who's with us today, described Gulf Whitland's somewhat uh, unilateral uh, expeditions to China and New Guinea before the 1972 its time election uh, by saying, common to both ventures was a high element of chance and luck. But like all risk takers in politics, war and love, interesting combination, Graham, <laughs> he had good luck because he'd worked hard for it. I'll back hard work over luck any day. And just as I believe that China and Gough Whitlam made their own luck, I'm confident that hard work in New South Wales on restoring fiscal discipline, on improving our productivity so we can compete for economic growth opportunities, will produce the sort of luck we need to again make New South Wales number one. Thank you. <laughs>